This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Our sponsors this week are Skillshare, Beta Brand, and The Jordan Harbinger Show. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash walk in and get a free trial of premium membership. Discover what it's like to be comfortable and confident all the time. Go to betabrand.com slash walkin for 30% off. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This week, I'm excited to sit down with my friend Jeff Charles. Jeff Charles is a freelance writer, political commentator, and contributor for redstate.com, libertynation.com, and co-hosts The Red and Black Show. He is also the founder of the Breaking Conservatarian podcast. Jeff has appeared on I'm Right with Jesse Kelly, Russia Today, and Fox Soul. He resides in Austin, Texas, and enjoys binging TV shows, reading history, cool hats, and all things nerdy. I'm with Jeff Charles, everyone, and we are overdue. Welcome. Hey. Rockins, welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. I, I, I haven't been this excited about an interview in a while, so... I'm excited too. Tell tell us just a little bit about who you are for our our listeners who might not be familiar with you and your work. Yeah, yeah. My, my name is uh, Jeff Charles. Uh, I am a political commentator. Um, I write for two conservative sites uh, mostly, uh, LibertyNation.com and RedState.com. Been doing this for about probably about four or five years or so. Before I wrote for those sites, I've I'd done pieces for even the Huffington Post, which was a surprise that they even let me write anything for them. But <laughs> but yeah, so I, I've been doing this for a while, but I've been into politics for decades. It, it's always been something that I've been passionate about. So somewhere along the line, I ended up uh, becoming a writer. And now this is what I'm doing full time. Wow. So you're kind of similar to me in that respect. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Except I never wanted any of this. I I, I, (laughs) I, so what, what were you doing before? Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Southern California. Um, okay. I, I come from Rancho Cucamonga. And yes, if you're thinking about next Friday, yes, and that's that, it's, it's that Rancho Cucamonga. That's where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, a, about an hour east of LA. So it's a suburb of LA. I was originally born in LA, lived in the South Bay area, and then moved to Rancho when I was in eighth grade. But now I am in Austin, Texas, which is basically oh, wow. California in Texas. Yeah, it is like little LA, I hear. Yes, yeah. I love it. I I mean, I'm a conservative, but I I love Austin. I love the people here. I love the city. I love the vibe. Yeah, that's where we're thinking of going. It's one of of the places on on the list of places to run from. (laughs) It's so hard because I love, it's sad what's happened to LA. It's so, it makes me upset because I didn't mind really, I love the weather and I've always joked that LA is a place where people love the weather more than they love their families. <laughs> it's like, it's just so good. And I lived in Minnesota. I lived in the Northeast. I hate snow. I hate the cold. I just don't want to do it. I'm like, I did my time. I don't need to do that. So I had no problem paying higher taxes, higher cost of living because I'm like, well, look around. It's 80 degrees and it's, it's you know, March. And I know what it looks like on the East Coast right now. It's not pretty. So... Mm-hmm. That was okay, but now it seems like the governance, I mean, even, and and I wasn't a small business owner. Now I am. Mm-hmm. And now I have myself on payroll and I see how many taxes are going out of my individual paycheck. And also as a business owner, it's like in, insane. Yeah. <laughs> like how does any small business owner survive here? They don't. Yeah, they they don't. And it's always been like that. I mean, I, I used to work for a company that helped people incorporate their businesses. And California and New York were the worst. I always mm. felt so bad for people who would call in because they had to go through so much crap and pay so much yeah. in taxes and all of the regulations. I mean, I don't even see how anybody could start a business in in those states. I mean, I, I have a friend who knows somebody who wants to move out 
and they have a bar that they want to sell, but they can't sell it because nobody wants to be, be in business, especially right now with the whole COVID thing. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. I, I think the housing market's still okay here somehow, magically. I don't really understand. Maybe probably just people from out of the country coming and buying with cash. But probably. my friend went to go buy a house here recently, which is crazy to me. But there were eight other people that had put in offers. Oh, so wow. the market still seems it hasn't come down, surprisingly. And then there's so many New Yorkers moving here, which is hilarious mm. to me. <laughs> that we, that I, get, I, I guess, are just like, okay, I, I'll just get better weather, but the same crappy governance. Exactly. But yeah, I look at it and I, I don't know that it's, I just don't see how it's sustainable for somebody with my values. And it seems this is to me the great thing about America be that I can leave. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, yeah. I, can, I can move to another state. I'm not stuck in this country of California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're not. I mean, and when I left, I mean, more people were leaving than coming to California. I, I don't know if it's that's still the case, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's so I think much. It is. Yeah, I mean, people in Texas are feeling it. They're getting tired of us coming here. But I mean, I, I I saw a bumper sticker a while ago that says "Don't California my Texas," and I'm like, yeah. it's not all. It's not all of us. It's not all of us. I promise. Well, and I think it's mostly people who share Texas values. Yeah, that's what I think too. I think a lot, a lot of the California because think people think that everybody in California is liberal. That's not true. I mean, no. If you look at that area between Los Angeles all the way up to San Francisco, that whole area, you're going a little bit more red there. I mean, it's just the way the politics are set up. It's set up in a way that allows Democrats to maintain supremacy over the state. But a lot right. there are a lot of conservatives or centrists who live in California that would move to a place like Texas and not necessarily vote for the same values. I know that's that's their concern, but I don't think a lot of us are, well, there might be a lot of us doing that, but I don't think most of us are doing that. Well, it's interesting, too. Most people don't realize that more people voted for Trump in California than Texas just because oh. of our population. I, yeah, so I didn't there's know that. Just, I'm pretty sure that's true. I will double check and fact check it. But it's it's we just have a big population and it's mostly red. The minute you get out of the cities, you know, it's Valencia's red. Most of Orange County is red, or even though they kind of flip back to blue. But right. Right. Most of the inner valley, when, like you said, driving up between L.A. and San Francisco and Sacramento around mm -hmm. all of the farming area. And they did a study that I was just reading in Texas, and they find that most of the first generation Texans are the are actually keeping it red or purple and that it's second and third generation Texans who are voting blue. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I think on the right, we blame a lot of things for what's going on in, going on in Texas. I mean, because the Democrats are making a huge push here. And a lot of them are blaming it on demographics, you know, immigration, that kind of thing, or illegal immigration, which, I mean, illegal immigrants are still not allowed to vote in these elections unless they're being sneaky about it. But they're not doing that in numbers enough to influence the elections. Like, by the way, like Beto O'Rourke didn't almost beat Ted Cruz because of illegal immigration. Right. Right. It's because the Democrats are not afraid to go into areas that don't normally support them and they're changing minds. And I think right. that we have to, uh, I think if we, we fail to realize that and become complacent, uh, my, this state will be purple. I mean, I, uh, the fact that I almost had to call Beta or work my senator still blows my mind, even though it's th like three years later. Yeah. I think one of the things I'm seeing in conservative in the in the black conservative community is this sense of frustration with the Republican Party for not doing that outreach. They just they seem to be I, I don't know anything about politics, everything I know I'm, I'm learning in the process. But it does seem to me like Republican, the Republican Party is more concerned with making it harder to vote than winning over hearts and minds and earning a vote. That's just my perception. I could be completely wrong. I mean, that has a lot of truth to it. I mean, now when it comes to voter suppression, I don't necessarily believe all of the left's narrative about that. No, I, I don't I think, either because yeah. I think it's crazy that you don't need an ID to vote. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. And and that they'll call that voter suppression. Right. You know, that's like, that seems so, I'm always surprised when I don't need my ID when I go to vote. 
I'm always like, here's my ID. They're like, no, we don't need that. I'm like, really? Yeah, like, exactly. That would be important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in voter ID laws, I mean, even Harvard has debunked the narrative on that. But I do think that in certain circumstances in states like Georgia, or especially what happened in, in North Carolina, there are instances where there are some things that are questionable, like, you know, shutting right. down voting locations so that people have to travel farther to vote. That right. doesn't necessarily... It, that in and of itself isn't going to completely stop people from voting, but it does provide an obstacle. And the more obstacles you put, the more likely it is that people are going to give up. I don't think that this happens enough to to sway an election the way they claim. I think they exaggerate it. But I think your larger point is right. I mean, the Republican Party isn't very good about getting new votes. They just rely on the base that they have. And, it, you know, it served them well f- supposedly for, you know, a few years, but that's not going to cut it anymore. I mean, the the Democrats are not afraid to go into Republican areas to get votes, but the Republicans are afraid to go into, and not just black areas, but they're, they're afraid to go after new votes. I mean, I just think that the establishment has become so fat and lazy that they haven't bothered to really consider these, these issues. I mean, you had like Stacey Abrams in Georgia, she registered almost a million new voters, people who hadn't wow. voted before. Right. She registered. Them. So we're, so basically we're here making fun of the way she looks and, 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 and clowning her. And, and while we're doing that, she's kicking our asses in Georgia over t- a 10 year period, because I mean, this didn't just come out of nowhere. This had been going on for 10 years that they were building this up to where they finally, I don't think they've necessarily flipped Georgia, but they got it to vote Democrat. Right. If, and the, the Republicans need to, well, my frustration is that they don't think strategically like this. They just kind of just right. do what they've always been doing. They seem to be do what they've always been doing and reactive yes. instead of kind of proactive. Because I look at, you know, the younger and again, I have issues with, you know, for instance, the squad, the young members of Congress. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, the younger Republican members just seem so cringe. <laughs> I know. You know, they're on the left, like they're annoying and they can be whatever. They do. They I mean, I will give AOC credit. She gets shit done. She yeah. was raising money for people in Texas. You know, she's Ooh, out there. Yeah, you're about to get me hot right now because I was <laughs> so mad about that. But go go ahead. I'll interrupt. That she was raising money? Or that that <laughs> No, I was mad that she made us look stupid and we let yeah. her do it. I mean Yeah, she's good like that. I will give I give her credit, man. She's she's a moron, but she's savvy. (laughs) Well, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, she may not be smart in some areas, but when it comes to persuasion, when it comes to to getting her ideas out there, she is a genius and we're stupid for sleeping on her like that. I mean, yeah, this I mean, I went through that whole ice storm thing. And then when Ted Cruz tried to get away and go to Cancun, I don't know what he was thinking. And I was so mad at him about it because I like Ted Cruz. But yeah. after he did that, then you have Beto O'Rourke raising money. AOC, yep. a New York Democratic Socialist raising $5 million yeah. for people who don't even like her. Yeah. And our senator went off and tried to go to Cancun. That was a horrible yeah. look. And it was the dumbest thing that we could have done. And then not only that, but the way we reacted to it, we reacted by criticizing her for doing it. Oh, it's just a photo op. Oh, she's yeah. doing it to, to spread her ideology. Yeah. So what? The people who are going to get that food, get the food that she bought, don't care what her ideology is. Right. And if right. we keep approaching things that way, we deserve to lose. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because I got a lot of crap for dragging Ted Cruz because I thought it was just horrible optics. And then what drove me crazy, even more crazy, is that the hypocrisy from pundits drives me bananas. So Mm. pundits on the right who would rightly call out a Democratic leader for doing the exact same thing were defending him and saying, so what? What can he do? Which is a horrible argument from my perspective, because this guy is being paid by you especially pundits who are in Texas. I'm like, you're paying for him. So you're telling me that this guy is basically worthless. You know, he's a, he's essentially a pointless human. And then people were like, Oh, I just respect the honesty. And, and a lot of my friends were like, who cares what he does? He's, he can do whatever he wants. And I had one friend and she was, she's really funny. And she was like, I like it when people are just dirt bags, but it, it makes me sad because we have such low standards for our leaders. I'm like, you're a leader 
act like a fucking leader. That's yeah. I don't feel like that's too much to ask of our leaders. And the fact that people are like, who cares? I'm like, I don't care if he was a private businessman. I don't give a shit if mm-hmm. it's like somebody. But this is a person who's supposed to care about the people and just don't leave. Like, don't do anything. I, I don't know that that whole thing, the reaction to it, to me, even from people who are friends and they were like, oh, who cares what he does? Who cares if he goes to Cancun? I'm like, it's sad that you don't care. And also that you can't see just how hypocritical people are around this. Yeah. And I mean, and, and you said that we have low standards for our leaders. I'll push back a little bit. We have very high standards for our leaders if they're on the other side. <laughs> if they're right, on our right, side, right. then we lower our standards. If Ted Cruz had a D next to his name, you better believe all the conservatives would have been out in full force slamming yeah. him for, for what he did. And, <laughs> yeah. and the thing is, and they, they, then they want to divert by bringing up Andrew Cuomo and how the media wasn't covering that before. And I get that, but two things can be true at once. Ted right. Cruz, that was a bad decision. And Andrew Cuomo is an alleged scumbag. And the media are dishonest for not reporting on it the right way. We don't have to... Right. I don't like the idea that we have to just be so entrenched in our teams that we can't call out people on our teams for for bad behavior. Now, here's the thing. If somebody says, I don't care what Ted Cruz did, and I wouldn't care if you were a Democrat, I can at least respect the consistency, even if I don't agree. But if if their standards change depending on what letter is next to the person's name, that's not helping anything. I mean, we've always had this kind of team sports mentality, but over the past four years, four or five years, it's gotten so much worse to where we will literally excuse anything that somebody on our side does because uh, they don't want to give the other side a point. Right. This isn't soccer. (laughs) Yeah, except how do you... You know, I see people like you and there's there's a crew of people who are trying to be principled and and call out call balls and strikes. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like you guys don't have the audience. You know, that's why I love speaking to as many of the people, because I feel like that. It's like Jonah Goldberg said to me once, nuance doesn't sell. Nuance, you know, there's no money, money in nuance. Money nuance, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I'm, I'm working on, on a book that, um, <laughs> it, and I actually use that phrase, there's no money in nuance. It's basically, it's a satirical look at how the Republican Party deals with the black community. And th- that saying is very applicable in that in that respect, there is no money in nuance. The people who want to actually have a nuanced conversation about the black community or about politics in general, you will get attacked by a lot of people. Now, I will say that, I mean, a lot of my followers follow me because I'm nuanced and because yeah. they're not married to their teams, but I still get slammed a lot. I mean, at Red State, we were, we were joking around and um, they were trying to figure out who's the most hated on the side. Is it me or another guy who criticizes Trump a lot? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I, I mean, I do get a lot of hate in the, in the comments when I publish certain articles. I mean, I, I'll throw them red meat all day long. But if I'm talking about a certain thing where I, where I think a Republican did something wrong, I'm going to say it. I'm not going to try to right. obfuscate it. I'm not going to write the article and say, oh, and by the way, somebody else on the other side did this too. So l- let's just talk about that. No, I'm just going to say if a Republican did something wrong, he did something wrong. That's it. Right. I do the same to Democrats. Yeah. And it's interesting to see. I mean, we see people. One of the tweets that I wanted to talk to you about was our Candace Owen. She had that tweet about the black community. And she seems to be someone who has broken through, obviously. She's massive. She's huge. I always joke that she's kind of, you know, all my like white conservative aunts and uncles are always mentioning her. And I'm like, she's all the boomers, like best black friend. (laughs) She's like every (laughs) boomers black friend. In some ways, though, I think she has. Do you think that she's been helpful? And in bringing more conservative black voices to the forefront. Do you think she's changed minds or she's helped kind of wake people up? I think it's more just given them the courage to kind of come out as, as a conservative. Not really. No. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I can see how somebody who might have been a black conservative but didn't really want to talk about it might have been more emboldened. But I, I don't think she's had as big of an impact as it seems. 
I think, and and I don't always like talking about her specifically because it's not just her. It's what I call Black Conservative Inc. I mean, you've got a lot of Black Conservative establishment types who basically take the exact same approach that she does. And I think people make the mistake of thinking that, you know, her her message is new or that her message is hers. The message is not hers. The message that she puts out for white conservatives has been passed down through generations. There have been Candace Owenses in the past. People just either forget or they or the younger people just don't know. But there have always like, been black men and women who have been very much pushed by the establishment conservative movement and the Republican Party to represent black conservatism. And I mean, can you give an example of someone who's come before her? Yeah, I mean, we, we've had Stacey Dash, we've had Crystal Wright, Larry Elder's been around for a long time, Jesse Lee Peterson. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of this is new. I mean, they, they were around when I was younger. So I yeah. mean, so I've seen, I mean, I've been conservative for about, I don't know, about 15 years so or so. So I've, I've seen them come and go, and I'll see these people come and go too. The thing is, is that a lot of the, the white conservative establishment, the elite, not rank and file white conservatives, they push these voices to the forefront not because they're actually working on getting black people over to the right. They're not there to reach out to black people. Their audience is mostly white. They're there to talk to white conservatives about the black community. They're not there to talk mm. to the black community. And I think that, I mean, and I came to the conclusion a while ago, and I'm not the only one who's come to this conclusion. I'm reading a book right now called uh, uh, Republicans in the Black Vote, and this author came to the same conclusion as well. But the establishment on the right the, the boomer con mentality, and I, I'm not trying to slander, slander boomers because there's a lot of boomers who get it, but they we love the boomers. Yeah, exactly. They love the boomers and they put these people forward, these black faces forward for a few reasons. But the main reason is to put forth the illusion that they actually care about reaching the black community. The reason why is because if you were to ask the average white conservative, if they would like to see more black people and Hispanic and what have you on the right, 99.9% .9 of them are going to say yes. Yeah. They want that to happen. So they play on this desire because I mean, white conservatives are tired of being called racist all the time. They would like to see more, more people, people of color in quotes on the right. So <laughs> these people are put up to kind of give the impression what? that that's happening. Like Blexit, Blexit was meant to give the impression that they are actually trying to reach black voters when in reality, they're not. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. The online learning community is offering our listeners a free trial of premium membership. No matter what 2021 brings, you can spend it creating something meaningful with Skillshare's online classes because time is what we make of it. There's so many fascinating classes on Skillshare on topics pertaining to the business of being a freelancer, writing a business plan, and many of the problems we run into as entrepreneurs like how to manage our time, productivity, Tax season is here, and thank goodness Skillshare had an entire class about bookkeeping for freelancers, How to Handle Your Finances by Emily Simcox. Bookkeeping is something that I recently, even just doing my taxes, uh, have been confronted with, and I really wanted to know how to do it. And Emily's class is really great for anybody, especially just for a quick overview. She does a great introduction, why it matters. I think this is an area where a lot of people, especially creatives, tend to not think of themselves necessarily as business people or let these things slide or get disorganized. And it creates a massive problem later when you're trying to do your taxes. So getting on top of this stuff early is really important. There's so many classes like this on Skillshare. This one really helped me particularly in the past couple of months. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life so you can move your creative journey forward without putting life on hold. Their short classes are a perfect fit for your busy routine. Explore your creativity at skillshare.com slash walkin where our listeners get a free trial of premium membership. That's two weeks free at skillshare.com slash walk in. And what do you mean by in reality, they're not just by the numbers, just based on the voting or the can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, I can base it on the voting, but the voting is just a result of them not really talking to black people. That's why right. the numbers aren't there. I mean, President Trump increases black support, but he did that because of himself. It wasn't right. because well, black men love him. 
black men, <laughs> I mean, at, at least 25%, they love Trump. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't translate into support for the Republican Party. And I think people are mixing that up. They support Trump, right. but not the GOP. There's a whole right. history behind that. But the thing is, is that they're not, they don't address the black community. They don't talk to the black community. They rarely show up at black events. Blexit was never really held in black areas, except for maybe one. And most of their audience is white. I don't care about their audience being white. Most of my audience is white. But when you're mm -hmm. holding yourself as up as somebody who says, hey, we're going to get a, a mass black exodus from the Democratic Party, and you don't talk to black people, then issues of, of, of honesty are raised. I mean, it, it seems mm -hmm. almost fraudulent at some point. But again, this isn't new. The, the establishment has been doing this for decades. And there have always been people like myself and like others like Sonny Johnson, you know, uh, Maj Ture, uh, plenty of others who have been trying to get the, the party to actually go back to its roots as the party of mm -hmm. Lincoln. They mm -hmm. just haven't gotten the same play, like you said. But the reason why that's changing now is the same reason why conservatives have been able to get around the, the far left's hold on the media. We have uh, mediums like podcasting, YouTube, Twitter, right. fa Facebook, social media to get around the gatekeeping that used to happen because you would never have somebody like myself on Fox News 10, 15, 20 years ago because they right. didn't want they don't want their audience to hear what I have to, have to say. Right. But now th now people are able to make their voices heard. And that's why you're seeing this huge conflict in the black conservative movement. I was I was asked an interesting question at dinner the other night by Sarah Siskind, and she, I love the question because it pushed me really to think. And she asked, what is the wokest belief that you agree with or the closest you can come? You know, it really made me think I started listing a lot because I'm yeah. a, you said you're a conservative for 15 years. So were you a liberal before that or did you just not identify or were you not? What is the history there? Yeah, I voted for John Kerry. And then a, a few years after that is when I became more of a conservative. I mean, I was never really far on the left. I mean, I was more in line with the Democrats. I was opposing Bush's wars and stuff like that. But I was never, I mean, I still had conservative beliefs, just just like most black people who vote Democrat, actually. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the line, I realized, you know, I just don't really line up with that. I mean, okay. now I still have views that some would consider to be left wing, even though I disagree that they're left wing. But that's kind of how my evolution happened. I mean, I just realized, you know, I don't have much in common with these people. I don't think everybody's racist. I don't, you know, believe in all in this agenda that they're pushing. So, I mean, I figured, you know, even though I have my issues with conservatives and the Republican Party, I'm more in line with them as far as policy goes. Mm -hmm. So when you say things like I, the Fox viewer doesn't necessarily want to hear what you have to say, what are the things that you would say that might be uncomfortable for a mainstream conservative to hear from the black community? Uh, there would be a lot. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, one, y'all are racist. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a reason why people call you racist. Even though most of you aren't racist, <laughs> you fall into the trap that can, that lets the left paint you as racist. I mean, mm. I would say, you know, most, I mean, black people are not welfare queens. We're not into just being on welfare. Yes, I know what the numbers are, even though you kind of skew those to make it look worse. The vet, the majority of black people are not living in poverty. The, the majority of black people are not on welfare. We're not thugs. Most of us don't commit crimes. You say that, you know, oh, 1350, 50% 50 of homicides are committed by 13% of the population. Well, it's only less than 1% of black America that actually commits those crimes. So this mm -hmm. is, so the violence that you see in black neighborhoods, the gang violence that you see is not because of black culture per se. I mean, now you can say it's part of hood culture, but it's not black culture because if that were the case, you, those numbers would be a lot higher. You're not as likely, you're not really that likely to be killed by a black person. Now, some people are trying to make a certain point when they use those statistics, but in reality, they're only using it to downplay the impact of racism, which would be the next thing that I would say that might trigger some conservatives. Yes, racism is a thing. It does exist. And there is racism in our systems. Do I think that all of our systems are completely racist? No. And mm -hmm. that's where and that's where the balance, I think, needs to be. I mean, the problem with conservatives is that they're always reacting to what the left is saying. So if the left is 
making it sound like Klansmen are waiting behind trees to lynch black folks every day, <laughs> then right. the Republicans go and say, oh, well, there is no racism at all in our government. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's what always drives me crazy about yeah. the right is they'll be, the left acts like racism is everywhere and the yep. right kind of acts like it's nowhere. And I feel like there's got to be some balance. Yes. And it was interesting to me to watch, you know, I think a lot about, these things obviously and have conversations and I love that I can have these open conversations with anyone and were you still in California for the riots or you were gone uh, the other yeah I was um no not that the ones this summer this oh the summer. summer oh oh no 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 I was uh, yeah okay. I, I moved out here about nine years ago Oh, okay. So you've been there a while. Yeah, that's we're talking about the LA uh, riots. <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah, I was there for the LA riots. Yeah. Um, no, these recent riots over the summer or the protests, I guess, but also riots. I watch. I was watching local news, Fox 11, and it was 12 hours of live coverage, and it was all local news. They did a great job. They were like all over the whole city interviewing people. But I will tell you, it was fascinating to watch these stores getting looted and it was i would say 99 percent young black kids and all the locals were like these kids aren't from here they're not mm -hmm. from here and like the local people i've talked to were like they're from watts and da, da, da. Mm -hmm. and most of the kids that they stopped to interview who were happily taking selfies while they took all the sneakers had no clue why they're even there you know they didn't even know who george was they had no concept they were just like this is it was like completely an opportunity mm -hmm. but this talk about optics that that happening for 12 hours straight in a city and now these polls are coming out that you know those things happening over the summer made people feel even more unnerved than like the capital riots for instance they had mm -hmm. a they had a bigger influence on the way people felt what in the hell is, what do we do? Like, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> what? It, it, I was just mad because I'm like, you guys, <laughs> this doesn't help with like the, the perception, you know? Yeah, it doesn't. And unfortunately, I mean, the media, whether it's right or left, they're there for the narrative and not so much the truth. I mean, and w part of my motto is I prefer truth over narrative. And when you look at the riots from last year, everybody had their agenda, right? I mean, people said, oh, well, they were mostly peaceful. Well, I mean, if you look at the numbers, they were obviously mostly peaceful, but right. conservatives got mad when they said that. But then when the riots at the Capitol happened, I was like, oh, so can I defend this as mostly peaceful? Because most of the people there weren't participating in the riots. Now, right. will I defend it? Yeah, I did. I, and I did. And I gave the same defense for both because the, the rioters don't represent the people who were actually protesting for the cause on e either side, but guess who the media wants to focus on? They want to give the microphone to the fringe people, to the, to, to the ones who are the most extreme. And, you know, it, it, it happened with Ferguson too. Most of the people that were rioting there were not even from that area. Right. I mean, the people who were saying Black Lives Matter, they were there to just protest what happened. You know, regardless of what people think of how that whole thing went down, the rioting was done by people who just wanted to get free shit. I mean, they weren't there because right. they cared about what happened. That's why all these kids were there. They wanted sneakers. Exactly. They just like wanted free sneakers and they were pretty young. And it was it was interesting just because there was... I felt like this news organization actually did a pretty good job of because it was happening in real time and most of it was live. Mm -hmm. So there was no narrative. It was literally just them running around being like, oh, now we're in front of REI. Oh, there's a woman defending REI. Oh, now. Mm -hmm. And also there were white kids who were agitators that you would see on camera, two white kids in black, break the glass, leave. Like it seemed mm -hmm. crazily organized, actually. And they yes. were driving up in like Mercedes and SUVs. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a wild thing to just watch unfold because it felt like as a citizen just in the city, I was like, oh, wow, it doesn't take that many people to create a lot of chaos that's basically out of control. You know, they yeah. they could not get a handle on it. And I think that's why for people who live in these cities, it was probably something that was more. And I felt the same way about the Capitol. I'm like, there's no what like this seems I don't understand how there w was not a bigger police presence. And then when you see that in the summer, there's a massive police presence and the whole 
Like it, it's all so wild to me, but it does seem like some of it is more excused. You yeah. know, I saw a lot of the rhetoric from the far left of like, well, these corporations have looted America. And almost like the corporations kind of felt like they agreed with that. And they were like, ah, whatever. It's an insurance claim. Yeah. Yeah. But but, but, but what they leave <laughs> out, deliberately what they leave out is that the people who were the most devastated were business owners, black business yeah. owners, minority business owners, small yeah. businesses. 40% of small businesses don't even have insurance because they can't afford it. And even the ones that do have insurance are underinsured. So the whole, right. oh, they have insurance, that that, that doesn't work. The, the fact is, is that the far left, they, they don't care about black people. I mean, if we're talking about the mm. riots, I mean, even if you look in a lot of cities like Portland and others, most of those people were white in, yeah. in those areas. You saw yeah. you saw those Antifa people glomming onto the Black Lives Matter movement, which white leftists do a lot when it comes to black causes. They use it as their pet and their and their and their front so that they can conduct their operations. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, you have the, and what I usually have to tell conservatives is that when it comes to like Black Lives Matter, like they want to say, oh, Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. No, it's not. Most of the people <laughs> rioting are, are, aren't even part of Black Lives Matter. But you have the global Black Lives Matter organization. You have the overarching organization. And then you have your local chapters. Now, the global organization, that's where you get the communism and the Marxism. And I say that that Black Lives Matter are white progressives in black in political blackface. That's what they are. Mm. They use black faces to push their white progressive agenda, which is why their website had all that stuff about, you know, dealing with the family and, and about the, the alphabet community, which, by the way, I don't necessarily have a problem with. But I mean, if you're saying that this is about police brutality, what, what the hell does all this, all this other stuff have to do with it? Right. But then, right. When, but then when you have your local chapters. You might have local chapters who are more in line with the Marxists. That's true. I think the one in Austin probably is. But then you also have the Black Lives Matter in Utah, which actually supported a Republican candidate and stood with the Proud Boys at a press conference to denounce denounce racism and police brutality. So it's right. a lot more. I mean, this is where we get into nuance. Black Lives right. Matter is more of a nuanced issue. There are aspects of that movement that I love. And then there are aspects right. of it that I hate. I mean, I don't agree with it fully. I don't disagree with it fully. I take it on an individual type of basis. But I mean, that's the agenda. And then it gives right wing media a chance to say, oh, well, look at those riots. Let's paint all of it as that. And then right. and then none of <laughs> those us those kids. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I was just gonna say, but, but, but then there's no sense of understanding. There's there are issues that conservatives would have in common with a lot of people who march and say Black Lives Matter, and they don't right. know it because their media isn't going to tell them about it. Right, and I mean, I would say those kids, if you ask them about like. They don't know any of the ideology that's underpinning no. Black Lives Matter. They're not. I mean, my question and when I was watching this kind of unfold, I'm like, I just want to hug all these kids and ask. My question is, how do we help them? You know, what what is being done to serve that community that is just opportunistically looting because they can? That yeah. ultimately is not going to help them in the long run in California they're I don't think they're really even being penalized or I think it's pretty much like whatever but in how does that really serve you know as as I say and as they say in like recovery like play the tape forward how mm -hmm. so say that we're say we're justifying and this is what on the left I don't understand why I don't I agree with you I don't think they're helping because if you say look these kids have been systemically they live in a systemically racist society and these corporations have looted America and it's okay that they're looting these stores because now they're getting what's theirs. But ultimately, how are you serving that community by telling them just go steal? That's fine. Where does that leave them? Well, it leaves them exactly where the far left wants them. They don't want to solve this problem. Now, right. if, now if you're talking about just regular rank and file Democrats, yeah, I, I think that they do want to solve the problem. I think regular like liberals and even some uh, that might be further leftists, I think rank and file people would like to do something about this. But when you've got the far left establishment talking about defunding the police, even though the majority of black people don't want that. Right. You can kind of already tell that they're, that this isn't re really about safeguarding black lives. I mean, you defund the police. Who's that going to negatively impact? 
black people. It's not going to impact the white progressive activist who is advocating for that because they're going right. to be living in their gated communities with all the rest <laughs> of the Karens. But when it comes to the actual people who would, would be affected, they, they don't want to defund the police. They want police held accountable. That's what they want. They, right. they want to deal with qualified immunity, whether that means getting rid of it or changing it around. They want to they, they want a, 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 a mechanism by which police officers can be held accountable because that is the main problem. They know that they right. can get away with this stuff because it's very rare that a police officer will even get tried. I think it's only like 30% of them actually get tried in court and even 30% of those who actually get convicted and even a smaller percentage percentage that actually sees jail time. So that's the problem. Right. So when you're talking about, you know, defund the police or just have social workers, some of that, I mean, might be applicable depending on the situation. Like if there's waste or fraud or they're spending money on, on whatever, then okay, maybe you move that to somewhere else. But I think the problem is that they're not really here to help anybody. They're here to use this to promote their agenda. So how do we help? I was just thinking when you said all the rest of the Karens and there's this part of me that's like, am I a Karen? <laughs> no, you're not a Karen. <laughs> you are far um, from a Karen. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That that seems to be something that I've been really thinking a lot about and writing about and something I noticed even with the rhinos when I went to South Africa. I It's like the problem with the rhino is the problem with everything. And this is a piece I'm trying to work out because mm -hmm. I see it with every problem. Essentially, there's not very much incentive to solve the problem. It's like you said, they don't actually want to help solve this problem because in in some ways it's better to just have a depend a culture that's kind of dependent on you yeah and i don't i don't know it for instance with you know ngos and nonprofits, there's a lot of incentive in having these problems persist because then they disappear when there's no problem when the problem has been solved let's just take this example the young kids who are looting over the summer now, a lot of ink has been, sp and you can say this about the disenfranchised whites on the <laughs> right uh, who are out there causing problems too. How do we actually help them, in your opinion? How do we help these populations of people? That is a, a tough question. Um, I think government plays a role, but it's not all of it. I think when we talk about non-governmental things that we can do, we have to support people who actually do want to solve the problem. Being able to, to, to discern which is which, I mean, which are actually trying to do things to help and which are just trying to get fat and lazy off of, you know, whatever. And the thing is, there are a lot of organizations, especially when it comes to disadvantaged black kids, you know, at mm -hmm. risk. And, you know, and, and that's yet another issue that I have with conservatives because they make it sound like they only care about violence when it's a police person doing it or police officer doing it. But in reality, there are a lot of organizations, black led and black staffed that are there to, to, to mentor disadvantaged children. Now, mm -hmm. in these neighborhoods, you've got white kids living there, too. So it benefits them as well. I think that identifying the organizations and the leaders who actually and amplifying these people too, right. you know, if you have a platform, amplify them, which I've tried to do on Red State. I've actually you know, written articles about it, but making sure that they have the funding that they need to actually help to take care of these issues. So that that's one aspect. The other thing, I mean, what, if, if I'm talking to how, how the government plays a role, the fact that the Democratic Party runs most of these cities and has no competition is an issue. The Democrats right. don't have to do anything anything because they know that they will still maintain power because they did the work to earn the votes. The Republican mm. Party will not compete. So if you know the Republican Party isn't going to compete for your vote, why not keep them dependent on you? I mean, if you look at uh, Sonny Johnson, she's a commentator. She always says, you know, if they want to be the party of the poor, they have to keep you poor. And they're right. being allowed to do that because they can. Why, why should they Why should they do anything different when, they, when they're not going, going to face any real consequences. I mean, the issue is that it's not that black people are so crazy about the Democratic Party. They just don't view the Republican Party as a viable alternative. There would need to be competition at the local, at the state level, and at the federal level. I, like Just to give you a quick example, in this past election, the city of Chicago had Democrats elected. They won the primaries, and after that, they were in because they had no competition. 50 positions, 50 seats in their state wow. legislature. 
they just sailed on in because they had no no Republicans out there to challenge them. So it, it's very this issue goes pretty deep. I mean, especially mm-hmm. with the um, where the local Republican parties have failed and failed deliberately. It just it creates a really bad situation. And do you think that situation is getting better or do you think it's getting worse? I I can't say it's getting worse. Because it's already pretty it's, bad. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, it can't get any worse than it is. I mean, they're, they're already really shitty. I mean, the, the GOP doesn't do black outreach. So, I mean, it can't get worse than that. I do think it's going to get better. I am more white pilled on this. I think it's going to take some time, but I think a lot of conservatives are coming around and saying, well, wait a minute. The Candace Owen types are telling us that black people don't vote for Republicans because they're mentally enslaved and they're on a democratic plantation and they're all <laughs> leftists and well, all the all the other bullshit that they spew. But the reality is that it was the Republicans that failed the black community. The Republicans right. abandoned the black community. And this didn't start in the 60s with the Southern strategy. I mean, and, I, and there's some issues with that theory as well, the Southern strategy. But it began shortly after Reconstruction with the Lily White movement, where the Republican mm. Party started moving more towards appealing to white voters in the South and systematically kicking out black leadership deliberately to, to cater to these folks. So, I mean, the, Demo- the history of the Democratic Party when it comes to the black community is atrocious. But the Republican Party isn't much better. And most people <laughs> and most people don't know that. So yeah. they so it's almost like they developed this whole plantation narrative to, to, to distract from the fact that they fucked up and they continue to fuck up and they do it today, t- e- even now. So, yeah, there's a lot I've of been learning that more about it. that Lily White movement. Yeah. I never had heard anything about it. And I think I saw some thread on Twitter, which is when I love Twitter and it's at its best. Mm-hmm. And there was another thread that was going around and it was all the times that black people were just minding their own business and had, you know, businesses and communities. And then white people came along Mm -hmm. and just took it. And it was a long ass thread. Mm -hmm. And some of it, I think I I would have to fact check, obviously. Right. Of course. And then it was also too, just about how many times like white women were the reason for some of this stuff happening. It's fascinating. You know, it's like it's like I always talk about how I'm ashamed of the fact that I didn't know about the Tulsa riots and Mm -hmm. and Black Wall Street until like five years ago. Mm -hmm. That just seems to me like something I should. You know, you learn about the like old history, but this is pretty recent. Yeah, I feel like there's lots of history with the black community that we just don't learn. You're right. And I'm glad this is something about the modern You know, I think there is so much. This is what's frustrating as somebody who comes from the left is that I actually think there's a lot of progress being made and that there are things being revealed and younger generations are learning about aspects of our culture that were either left out or Mm -hmm. not deemed important enough to learn or just because it was racist. You know, it's just history belongs to the victors and people just we didn't learn those stories and those stories are insanely important to our history now do i think we toss the baby out with the bathwater and say that america is the worst country ever and we need to burn the whole thing down no but i do think context is important so this is an area where, again, I think nuance is important. It's, I, and I think most people feel this way, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is the thing that I hate about, like, the Robin D'Angelo's, is that they prey on that white guilt. It's grifting season. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Uncle Hotep. Grif- it's grifting season. Yes. <laughs> That's his it's line. It's grifting season. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like... It, because I think a lot of white people are like me. It's like, I'm, it's shameful that I didn't learn some of these things. Well, I can then educate myself about a lot of Mm -hmm. the history that I didn't necessarily learn. By the way, there's a lot of history uh, in general that I just didn't learn. Yeah, of course. Yeah. (laughs) Like I'm just, I'm learning how uneducated I am just in general, but I don't think that that kind of guilt is helpful. Just from my perspective. (laughs) No. And it seems weirdly racist. You know, it feels like, oh, let me let me learn so I can help you. There seems to still be this like 
upper and lower yeah. vibe to it where it's like she's like let me help you down there yes poor people below me <laughs> <laughs> well you know uh, you know it's like, it's like malcolm x said i mean and, and conservatives love to quote this malcolm x quote they only quote half of it though <laughs> Because he talked about white racists and he's saying a white conservative racist will be honest with you about it. They're like the coyote who will growl at you. But the white liberal racist is worse because they will pretend to be your friend. And mm. I, I think what's even more insidious about this is, is I think a lot of, of, of white liberals actually do want to help. And they don't see themselves as racist. Yeah, they don't they don't know it. They don't know it. Yeah. And they yeah. have and they have that white guilt, which honestly, white guilt to me and I think to most black people is awkward as hell i mean like yeah like don't don't come up to me telling me the how you're sorry for what people like you didn't do it <laughs> like like if you want to help definitely help but you but don't come at me me with your guilt <laughs> did you ever listen to the coach t episode that i did on this podcast with my friend coach t i did listen to it a long time ago he talks about this too he's like yeah I, it's it's actually insulting Exactly. Exactly. Like, like I'll make jokes about it. I mean, if you want to give me reparations, you can, but you don't have to, you know, <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, it's just, you know, in, in that history that we don't learn. And I think that probably contributes to it because they learn a lot of new history, like what happened in Tulsa. And then they feel, you know, guilty for it. But I'm like, you know, you can feel bad about it. I'm, I feel bad when I learn about things in history that aren't good, but you didn't do it. I mean, and and I even wrote an article for Red State about the Tulsa massacre, and I and in the comments, there most of that audience is white, and they were saying I knew nothing about this. Yeah, and I think some of this might even help to to change a lot of minds on the right, especially the ones who say, "Oh, racism is gone," or once the Civil Rights Act was passed in the '60s, racism just stopped, and all the impact from it just stopped, or they just think that the only racist thing that the government did to black people was slavery and Jim Crow. Well, no, there was more than that. There was that. There was redlining. There was redlining. Yeah, discrimination. Yeah. They, they couldn't get the GI Bill, housing. I mean, there's a plethora of the, the things that are now illegal but they set black people back so that right. you know white people were already ahead they got a head start and black people are trying still trying to catch up that stuff doesn't just go away because you pass a law right so i think that having more of these types of conversations is important because a lot of even on that tweet that Candace Owens did and i quote tweeted it and asked what people thought some people thought she was right and i asked just honestly not trying to attack you i said why do you think that one right. guy responded and he said you know you know, it's based on a lot of what I see in, in the music videos and basically what he saw in the media. These right. people haven't like sat down with black people and actually had these type, types of conversations. Otherwise, they would know that what Candace Owens says is our culture is not our culture. Right. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Now that we have been in quarantine forever, I can't imagine going back to wearing uncomfortable pants at work. I have a solution for that. Beta Brand's collection of pants that look professional while incredibly comfortable. Beta Brand combines customer experiences with their expertise to make thoughtfully designed clothing that's as functional, comfortable, and inspiring as your favorite workout gear. Their customer favorite dress pant yoga pants are made of wrinkle-resistant stretch knit fabric, making them perfect for literally anything you need to do. There are tons of different colors and styles to choose from, like boot cut, straight legs, skinny, cropped, and more. I am obsessed with the Beta Brand Dress Pant Yoga Pants Boot Cut Dapper. It has this almond herringbone pattern and pockets in the front, pockets in the back, which is the greatest thing for pants. I love pockets. I love pockets in my dresses. And they're super comfy and so cute. You look like you just came from a meeting and they don't make you feel like you need to unbutton them because you can't breathe. And they make your bum look amazing. I think these are the only pants I wear. Women love these pants because they fit so well and feel great on, allowing you to be confident and comfortable as you get shit done. Right now, our listeners can get 30% off their first beta brand order when you go to betabrand.com slash walkin. That's 30% off your first order for a limited time at betabrand.com slash walkin. Discover what it's like to be comfortable and confident all the time. Go to betabrand.com slash walkin for 30% off. I think, too, one of the problems I have with 
the rhetoric in the culture right now, particularly that's uh, really fueling a lot of the white guilt, is that somehow we have the we are the only race that's violent that takes that likes to colonize that likes to take civilizations over i mean this is like all of history there's mm-hmm. been yeah it's just not it's not just it's a human kind thing we all have violence yeah. in us we all have it's not some like property of white people. <laughs> right, no, it's not. It, white people do not have a monopoly on evil. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's the word I was looking yeah. for. We did that we have some kind of monopoly on that. It was weird. It was interesting being in South Africa talking to Uber drivers, mm-hmm. white people who came up through apartheid. I mean, it was a uh, education for sure just even in a very short time and now of course I'm like doing a deep dive on the whole history of the country mm-hmm. and one of the things, like you said, mm-hmm. white people who came up through apartheid, I mean, it was a education for sure, just even in a very short time. And now, of course, I'm like doing a deep dive on the whole history of the country. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, like you said, in obviously because of apartheid, black people were held back and mm-hmm. white people got a head start. Well, then apartheid ended, but now you have a pretty they didn't have the benefit of the same education as white people. Right. Now they're taking positions of power without the same education. And so you're seeing corruption problem. I mean, there was corruption obviously before, but how do we, you know, this was a conversation I was having with a lot of the people in South Africa. How do you educate the population so that it is that level playing field and Mm -hmm. It's it ends up creating problems. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. how do you feel about reparations? So reparations, I used to be staunchly against reparations. Now I'm I am more open to it, depending on how it gets rolled out. Like now, now, whoever figures that out are are people who are smarter than I am. But when you really dig into the history, I mean, there is no denying that what happened in the past still affects us today. I mean, again, just because you stop the practice doesn't automatically take away the impact that that practice had on future generations. So black people were not able to generate generational wealth the way whites were. And this was done by the government. So, I mean, I think what a lot of conservatives get wrong with the whole reparations conversation, because the thing is they they, they have an, an emotional knee jerk reaction to it. Not all of them, but a lot of them do because they don't understand the subject at all. They just think that it's going to involve white people writing checks to black people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, there are some people on the left who have suggested something like that, but not, but, but not for the most part. Reparations can come in the form of tax breaks. It can come in the form of, mm. of finding ways to help black people get more access to capital. Because um, mm-hmm. that's really one of the big problems. I interviewed a, a guy named Joe Sakela who was trying to start the very first black owned stock exchange. When that happens, mm. that will help a lot as well. Some have also suggested going after the corporations that participated in slavery because a lot of them are still around today and 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 finding ways to 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 alleviate what happened and help black people catch up generationally. I'm mm. not in favor of a solution that just writes a check. That's not going to that's a bandaid. That's that's not going to do much. But if they can figure out a way to do this in a way that is that is fair and equitable, I see no reason why not. It is a debt that the government owes. White people mm-hmm. don't owe this debt. Like if your ancestors did whatever, you didn't do it. So you don't necessarily own the debt, but it was the government that did these things. Mm-hmm. So when the federal government does something wrong, they've got to m- make it right. I mean, if, if you get hit by a government vehicle, you sue your city government. So this w- this is obviously, and just because it happened a long time ago, doesn't mean that they weren't still doing stuff that was w- related to slavery after it was abolished. So finding a way for the government to pay its debt, just like it did to Japanese Americans and to, in some cases, even to their kids who didn't experience it, then right. uh, there is no reason why the government shouldn't be held accountable. I mean, if you're a conservative and you say that you're against government tyranny, well, the government was tyrannical towards black people. So mm-hmm. it needs to find a way to... To, to provide restitution. I don't think that that is the only answer to fix the problem, but it could be if they come up with, if they they manage to come up with a solution that works, 
then why the hell not? If anything, conservatives should be leading the way on this because it, it was them who wanted to free the slaves and and actually get black people to a certain level before you know the lily white the lily white movement happened. But still, I mean, it's. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I joke that if I was a black person, I would be knocking on everyone's door who has a Black Lives Matter sign and asking them for their house. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> why doesn't anyone do this? Because I definitely would be. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I don't know why this hasn't. This movement hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Yeah, like, and you know what's sad. Hey, I mean, I, I don't house. talk about yeah, and and, and I, I don't even talk about reparations a lot mm-hmm. because I know it's not going to happen. I mean, the Democrats will never do reparations because they want to dangle it. I mean, they want to dangle it in front of black people, but they they don't want to do anything about this. I know Biden just recently came out and said, "Oh, well, they did that. They're doing that commission, but I want to actually do something about it." No, you don't. You're not going to do anything in about the new reparations. Bill, though, I feel like I read that there's a lot of money going to black farmers. Did I, is, yeah. is that true? I, I could be totally wrong. No, I, I remember seeing something like that too. And I have, and I don't really have a problem with that. Now that's not reparations, but I mean, if, if there, if there is an equi- equitable way to do it again, yeah. that doesn't result in, you know, you tax white people more to do it. Then, then I don't care. I don't know much about what he's doing. So I don't know if I agree with it yet or not, but I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the idea, at, at least when I initially hear about it. I'd have to do, yeah. do more research on it to find out if it's something that makes sense. I was like, how many black farmers are there? Well, and that's the other America. thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you definitely can't say it's reparation because, you know, it, most of us aren't out there. You know, we do the research and it's like two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like now, two it may incentivize more black people dollars. to become farmers, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just it was one of those things where I was like, is this a racist thought that I'm like, how many black farmers are there in America? That's not racist. That's a, that's a <laughs> valid question. Ha- but this is what happens when this is the it's that white um, guilt. It's not the white guilt. It's like also just because I'm pretty free. I'm mm-hmm. like, whatever I say, whatever. But I am sensitive. And that's yeah. the that is the weird balance. And again, it's a balance that I always try to be aware of where I don't want to hurt people. You know, mm-hmm. there's that balance of like, I'm going to push back against this culture where you're walking on eggshells because you're afraid of offending everybody. And yeah. I would never want to be racist. <laughs> you know, no one. Yeah. I I grew up in a family that was so liberal and so open minded. And but then I and again, when like when we were talking about one of the the like woke beliefs that I that I believe like representation matters. I actually think that's true. <laughs> mm-hmm. But with the problem with like the woke stuff is it's like they always go way too far. Yeah. You know, it's just it's too extreme. But I actually I can talk about it from just the perspective of body stuff where I was driving by a gap and there was a heavier woman who looked a little bit just more normal and I was like wow I never saw that growing up it was only like twiggy models and (laughs) I do think that that's I can see how seeing yourself represented in media is something that's important because the media is everything another one is implicit bias I think that there are biases we all have implicitly now does that mean I'm a racist baby? Like they're saying, you know, you need to like <laughs> train your baby to be, it's not enough for your infant to be racist. You have to be not anti-racist. Racist. And you have to be anti-racist, <laughs> your, your infant. No, I think that, that they've done enough studies with biology to know that you like children are just, they know the sound of their parents' voice mm-hmm. and they're, you recognize your parent. That's also just in us. What I do see happening, which is unsettling and disturbing to me, is I think we did a pretty good job for a while or we were making progress and that we are we were working against those tribal instincts that are just it's our core. Jonah right. talks all the, about this oh, in yeah. his book. And now I see a lot of self-segregation. I see this coming from the left and the right. Yep. I see it and how do you think You know, you mentioned like a black Wall Street, for instance. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Would everyone be just black owned only for black people or would anyone be able to partake in that? Well, so that's a very interesting issue. And I I think and especially even going back to some of the stuff that you just listed off. I mean, that's part of the, the an unfortunate tendency on the far left to take an idea that has an element of truth to it. 
and then they just take it to the nth degree and exaggerate it. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, like, I understand, like, when white people want to are sensitive about wanting to make sure that they're not offending people, there's, right. that's a good thing. But it's, it's, it's even like the, the theory of intersectionality, you know, that has a level of truth to it. I mean, yeah. for instance, my mom, she's a black woman. She's had a very successful career and she has dealt with racism and sexism. Right. That doesn't mean that everybody's racist and sexist, though. But so right. even like transitioning that into a conversation on, you know, black owned businesses or black owned cities or whatever, or there was that group of people that wanted to move to a certain state to establish a black area. When it comes to that, if it's voluntary, I, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm libertarian on that stuff. I mean, right. as long as it's not the government forcing them, forcing them to do it. Now, there are a lot of businesses that cater to minority communities. Like, uh, for instance, I mentioned Joe Sakala's uh, the, the, the Dream Exchange. When he gets that set up, that'll be a minority stock exchange that caters mainly to a black and brown audience. That doesn't mean that white people can't also invest in it as well. They're not necessarily excluding, but when it comes to who they're marketing it to, it's right. marketing it to the black community. Uh, you look at a Greenwood Bank that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Black owned bank. And again, to cater to to black Americans, I think on on my side in the conservative movement, they just see them. They automatically think, oh, this is segregation. This isn't what MLK wanted. First off, they don't really know what MLK wanted. They just know that one part of that one speech that he gave that they like right? and, and that I like to, you know, to be fair. But I mean, the thing is, is that this already happens like like you're in L.A. So, I mean, what, what where is it? I, if, if you go to Torrance a lot of Asians, or if you go to different areas, a lot of Asians tend to do business in their own communities. Koreans do this quite a bit. I've, I've seen, you know, I worked at a coffee shop that was bought by a Korean family. Mormons. It, <laughs> Mor Mormons do it too. Mormons do it too, yeah. yeah. So here, and the thing is, it, nobody ever says it's a problem. I mean, if you have an area where a lot of Asians live or Koreans and they have Korean banks, they have Korean bakeries, Korean whatever, and mm -hmm. they keep their money in their community, nobody complains about it. But once right. black people talk about doing something like that, oh, it's segregation, that's racist. Ah! But then they'll also say, well, black people need to, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and do their own thing. Right. So I don't have a problem with, with the black community saying, hey, why don't we keep our dollars in the black community and build wealth so that we can go up and be at the same level as whites? Doesn't mean that they're excluding people because white people can still buy something from a, a, a black store. So I, I think it's just, right. I think the, the solution is to really educate people because the response to it is is really irrational they're re responding without really knowing about it we're all ignorant of certain things so so the, you, you combat ignorance with education and when i've explained it this way to most conservatives they're like oh okay i didn't think about it like that okay okay that you know whatever i mean i would say the best example is the mormons because they will make it almost impossible for you to buy a house in the neighborhood because they prioritize their their own yeah. kind <laughs> you know yeah. they and it's hard to get a house in a neighborhood that's predominantly mormon they just it, they make it almost it's very challenging yeah they they have and, ways of of controlling who's yeah, allowed into the communities yeah and and nobody really Nobody really pushes back against that. But I think, again, you run into the fact that it's a re a religion. Right. So people are like, oh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but that's a great point. And it's it is true that, you know, the Korean community might keep keep the business within. But I don't know that it's. I just try and imagine if a white business advertised like, yep. hey, this is for white people, it would be considered racist. You know, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's the response. I, that's like the main response I get. And, uh, you know, and then when I get it, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, because like, the thing is, most people who say that aren't coming from a good place. Like, like when you bring it up, I know that you're actually trying to figure this out. But when well, a lot because of it ultimately, I understand why I understand. I understand why it's not, but on the other hand, then I'm also now I'm leaning more towards only white people can be racist yeah. because in, uh, in that understanding is implicitly admitting that like, how do I reconcile that? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I believe that, that you can be racist. No, I, everyone I fucking know is racist yeah, you know, I mean, on some yeah. level. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, so, so many, I, I've been to many countries and there's some like Indians are super oh, racist. Yeah. Chinese are the most racist people probably on earth. And, and like, I Did don't you see know that commercial co- with the, with the, what, with the washer and dryer in China? No. Oh, so horrible. They had that. So they were advertising a, a laundry detergent. And so this lady goes up to her washer and there's a black guy that comes out of it. And then she puts him back down and pushes in the detergent. And then five minutes later, it's a Chinese person that comes out. <laughs> oh God. That was racist as hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Europe, they're super racist. They're racist against each other within the small European <laughs> cu- countries. Yes. So I, again, don't think that white people have the monopoly on racism. No, but they don't. I also think I, I understand why a black owned business or a black owned Wall Street would want to advertise and try and mm-hmm. get those customers and appeal to that base. But you can do that if you're like, I don't know how to square this, Jeff. I just so, don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's, here, so here's the thing. I mean, you know, when you're talking about, you know, whether or not white people can um, form their own businesses or, businesses or whatever, people have to understand why they're doing this. They have to understand why people might say, I want to support a black owned business. It's because they want to close that disparity. It's right. not just because, oh, I just like black people and that's it. Although that might be the case for some. I mean, you know, p- we are tribal. But the, but the thing is, white people in general don't necessarily need to have that because there's not a whole history of the government doing things against specifically against white people. That being right. said, that being said, though, if a bunch of if a group of white people wanted to move to Maine or wherever and set up their own white community, I wouldn't care as long as you're not trying to get the government to enforce this on other people or, or what have you, even if you are racist, I don't care. If you're not affecting my mm. life, you can have whatever I, idea you want. Right. Y- your racism is not going to impact me what me what I'm trying to do. It's not going to impact my ability to make money. So right. do what you got to do. I don't care. But I mean, even if they're doing it and they're supposedly not racist, I honestly, I don't care. This is where I'm more libertarian on it. I'm not going to use mm. the government to to tell you that you can't form your own community. I mean, it's just whatever. Yeah. I'll make yeah, fun I of mean, it, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, I guess I'm only talking about it in the sense that obviously I would think, you know, you're none of these businesses are discriminating because that's illegal. So right. generally a Korean owned business, they might cater to Koreans. They might advertise in Korean mm-hmm. to Korean, but if I walked in there, they would probably, I don't think they'd turn me away. No, they'd I don't serve think you. they could. So as, as long as the businesses are not discriminating, then it's not a problem. I guess I was just thinking about it from a purely marketing standpoint where oh, yeah. like the idea of a white person starting a business. And just yeah, that like, won't work. <laughs> being like, hey, this is for the whites. <laughs> You'd have to like go down to Mississippi or something like that. And I don't know. <laughs> Shout out to Mississippi. Yeah, I, I mean, these are the conversations we need to have, though. You yeah. know, I think that because I think a lot of people are trying to work this stuff out. And I'm I really I was laughing. I had a great Uber driver in Dallas and she was ranting about Candace Owens. I don't know why it oh, came Lord. up. I think she, there was something on the news or something. And then she was ranting about, about black lives matter too. And she was like going off and I was like, okay, I'm a white person who wants to help how if you want. And she was like, give us money. <laughs> <laughs> She was like, support our businesses, support our. And I was like, okay, that's something tangible I can actually do. You know, yeah, (laughs) like supporting a black owned business is something very tangible that I'm more than happy to do. Well, and the fact that she said she didn't just say just go in your wallet and give me money. She said support our businesses. That is a conservative concept. (laughs) <laughs> You're going to get something for your money, but just support a black business, buy their mm-hmm. products so you can enjoy them. And then you're helping black entrepreneurship. That is a conservative principle. That's what I'm trying to get a lot of people on the right to understand. Like mm. these are not left wing principles. These are our principles that we claim to hold. We need to apply the same conservatism to black people that we do to white people. I mean, yeah, and and like you said, make it easier to get the capital to start those businesses. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I mean, it's it's just a uh, you occupy. I think you're one of the more reasonable 
people online and in this space. And I really wish that, and you're willing to have a debate with people. You know, I love that there's diversity of opinion in the black community. Yeah. You know, this is, this is this, the thing I push back against the most. And with my friends who came after me all through the election for not hating Trump, mm-hmm. I was like, if you had actual black friends, <laughs> a diverse <laughs> amount of them, and you had friends who were Hispanic, you would know that they don't all think in a monolith. Right. Like that, that is the most frustrating thing for me dealing with my liberal friends who come at me and tell me that I'm a racist bigot. I'm like, yeah, you actually sound more racist for trying to put all of these people in one group than anyone to me. And yeah. you seem to entertain a lot of diverse opinions, even just on your Twitter feed on your tell us, um, tell us about your, you have a new YouTube channel or, or i don't know how new it is yeah yeah it's a breaking conservatarian i started uh, a few months ago so yeah breaking conservatarian on youtube i've been doing a lot of live streams lately on monday and wednesday evenings normally a lot of the issues that i'm talking about right now do pertain to the conservative movement and the black community i talk about all kinds of things but with certain things especially right now after cpac i don't know if you saw maj Teres panel with uh with the black conservatives he had up there they were more of my style, so it made a lot of waves. But um, but yeah, I, I I talk a lot about these things, and you know, black people are not a monolith, and people on the right love to say that, and then they they love to call black conservatives free thinkers. But the problem is that they they think that black conservatives are a monolith. So right. <laughs> on my channel, I try to show that black conservatives are not a monolith. We're not all the black conservative ink type. We've been around for years. You just never heard from us. Now you are. And right. I think it's a good thing. I don't necessarily want their voices to go away. I want to add more voices. So right. yeah, you can have your black conservative ink, Candace Owens and Brandon Tatum, they can say whatever they want. I, I don't want their, their platforms to be taken away. I just want more voices to be added on to be able to entertain ideas that a lot of the white conservative audience has has not heard and just let the ideas compete like it's supposed to. So right. yeah, I mean, so on that channel and also, you know, when I write, I also try to you know, entertain different points of view as well. And even, you know, I just started my locals community and that when I, when that grows, I want to actually have a space for people who are really serious about politics and culture and to have really deep conversations on these issues like you and I are doing right now. The, I mean, if, if you look at the elites on both sides, they want us at each other's throats so that we don't have these conversations. They're the ones who benefit yeah. from the hate, not we don't benefit yeah. from it. So no, I, I always say this. Yeah. Locals is the best. I'm I love my community. I'm going to I'm going to tell them all to go join yours. Sweet. They, they just are the best. I love my community. They talk. It's it's actually been instructive and just you know, they I feel like the nice thing about it is you can really slough off all of the real people who want to have real conversations. I yes. work out with the women. Like we started a little workout group during nice. the plague and it has saved me and they were saving me over and over again because it really is a sense of community sharing recipes, wins, loses. P- there was a week where a couple of people were really struggling and they were just helping them. And it's just, I love that you can have those deeper conversations and you feel a little bit more safe because it's not subject to all of the trolls and the bots and the people who are bad faith. And it's a little bit, it's like a little think tank of your own. Don't, don't you think that people are craving that? I mean, I think people are craving. I think they are. Yeah. Yeah. I think most normal, reasonable people are, I think there's a lot of energy in our space. And I think that we just need to, the, I really believe truly my feeling i don't know that this is right but my feeling is that the only way to break this toxic binary that we seem to be caught in is like a third party win you know we need or or a cross party ticket you know we need some kind Mm -hmm. of um we have to break that binary somehow i and there's so much energy in that I feel like more people are in alignment. We might have disagreements about the ways in Mm -hmm. which to fix things, but at least we're still having conversations. There might be, there's so much energy there and it's just not, it's all scattered. Like how do I I feel like all we need is that lightning rod of a person or something who can take that energy and 
use it to run for, I don't know, president or something. I just, yeah, I, you know, I think, I think we, I think we need a lot of those people. I mean, in, yeah. in the media and everywhere. I mean, I think, you know, like you and I have talked about the exhausted majority before. I yep. think if they finally got pissed off enough to start pushing back against the fringe elements, not on the other side, but on their own sides, we would really see a difference. I mean, because the thing is, it's one thing if I call out the fringe on the left. I mean, I do that, but they're not going to listen to me as much as they will listen to somebody else who's on their own side, like like yourself and like people like like Matt Taibbi. He he they calls that out. They don't listen to me. No, they don't. They just push us out. That's the problem. Yeah, but because with the fringe, I, I think it's because there's not enough of you, <laughs> and there's not well, enough of that on the right either. There seems to be a growing number, but it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because you can't reason with insanity. Oh, and, that's true. And, you know, once you get to that extreme, I, I, like I choose to be at this point, I've come to the point that I want to talk to. There are people who have been red pilled, for instance. Right. You know, I, I see the way that like some of the people in our space are pretty aggressively. They're right about how toxic and destructive that woke ideology is. Mm -hmm. It's like black mold and it's insidious and it corrupts institutions from the inside out. Now, I agree that you have to push back against that. And there's a certain point where people who really know the ideology and know what they're talking about or believe it, you can't that I kind of have to dismiss it because I reject the premise on its uh, like wholesale. Sure. But then there are people who don't know. They don't know any better. And suddenly they'll get red pilled. And I have to give them a pathway into the center. I try to still be very compassionate mm -hmm. and understanding and not just push everybody away. Because what I am seeing right now is a lot of inter uh, people who should all be on the side, same side in some respects, even with differences. Mm -hmm. They're tearing each other apart. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just a human nature. You know, er everyone yeah. seems to be just kind of, I'm like, no, we're kind of all class. I think like the real fight in, cause I'm not on a team. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm an independent, but, but <laughs> if the war <laughs> came, I'm on a team. Yeah. I'm on a team that I don't even necessarily want to be on by sake of the other team has already decided that I'm on this team. Right. On Team Red. If it comes down to red versus blue, the, I, the blue won't even have me. They're right. not, they've already decided I'm Team Red, which is, I think, the biggest difference I see between kind of the extremes of the red and the blue. Although I'm not really subject to the far right in the way that people who push back against the right are. Because they might consider, would they consider you blue? I doubt it. Uh, n nobody on the left would consider me blue. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. But would anybody on the right say like, you're not one of us? They, would the extreme oh, right that. of your party be like, you're, you're a libtard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I have gotten that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I won't say that it's, it's common, but I do get it. You know, honestly, it's just from people who don't think, I mean, people who take a mindless approach. I mean, if I say something like, you know, police brutality is a problem. Oh, you're a libtard. Well, you're not a serious person. So, right. I mean, that's not, again, it's not common. They, they, I get a lot of people who may disagree with me, but the ones who, uh, but I like it when they do that. Cause now I know I, I can just dismiss them or I can just have fun and, and make fun of them. But, right. but yeah, there is a lot of that type of thinking. If you're not with me fully on every single thing, then you must be on the left that, that those are fringe people who don't think. So I, I mean, right. it doesn't surprise me that there are people on the left who would just say, Oh, you must be a racist nazi red wing or right 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 winger or whatever i mean that's most of the left they think i'm a, a bigot i would thinking. think yeah i would think that would happen more on the left and i think you probably get it more from the left than i do from the right well that's been my experience mostly is that uh, the right is just so happy to have you on your team <laughs> yeah. that, that they're kind of more welcoming than the left which will boot off any uh, like anyone they perceive as an apostate if you even push back at all and it's you're a religion. not kind of a like yeah, Michael Malice it's, says. It, it, it's it's a religion, and this is a, a cathedral. I call it the woke Sanhedrin, the Church of Progressivism, <laughs> and I do use those terms when I write because these people are adhering to 
a, a religion. And I mean, I've been to Black Lives Matter protests here in Austin, mm-hmm. and I got lectured by a young, probably t- 19, 20 year old, uh, nice white girl telling me why I should hate the police and why I should be afraid of them, even though most people with my same skin color don't want to, to get rid of the police. Right. They just, uh, they yes. just, it's, it's, it's almost like they just repeat their script, their, their scriptures. They quote their right. scriptures, but they don't know anything about the, the thing, the, the uh, issues behind it. Right. Or the ideology behind it. Mm-hmm. That's why the little phrase I have is you're not woke, you're annoying. Is be- and it, because <laughs> my friend was like, you should call them an idiot. And this kind of goes back to my point of how I don't want to reject people wholesale. I'm like, I find dismissiveness to be more effective than being mean spirited or calling them names because right. I reject the premise entirely. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you're just annoying. <laughs> I'm not even, <laughs> I won't even engage with this seriously because you can't in many ways. You just can't. I had to learn that lesson the hard way. I mean, cause I would go back and forth with, with these people on no. social media. And nowadays I'll, I just say, if I'm going to engage with you, I'm just going to be making fun of you. And I, and I, and I will use them to entertain my audience. <laughs> and that's, yeah, all they're good for to me. <laughs> I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode. The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to aside from mine. And I know that every day somebody tells you that you just have to listen to some podcast and you nod and say, sure. And then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best in 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guests, and when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. I recommend listeners check out the interview Jordan did with Matthew McConaughey, and he talks a lot about family, talks about grief and losing his father. He really tackles something that's covered a lot in this podcast, just that feeling of imposter syndrome and how he has learned to overcome it. He's also talked to Bill Nye about the importance of science and the scientific method. And the cool thing is that Jordan's always focused on pulling useful, practical insights out of his brilliant guests. And we're not talking about pop psychology or wishy-washy self-help stuff here. The episodes are loaded with bits of wisdom that you can use to legitimately change your mind and improve your life right away. We really enjoy this show here at Walk-In's Welcome. There's a lot of overlap in what we're doing. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. One of the things I saw that I was what, reading your stuff about like the Dr. Seuss stuff, which <laughs> I think we somewhat agree and somewhat disagree on. I agree that it was the company's decision. Mm-hmm that those images were probably not, they were racist. You know, the Asian ones, definitely. Oh, yeah. Dr. Seuss, I think, was not super stoked about them. I do think it's well within their rights to do that, and it's not that big of a deal, as big of a deal as probably everyone's making it. What does worry me is the panel... (laughs) <laughs> that they have evaluating these things and making these decisions and the studies that underpin these things are terrifying. I mean, they're not, they're not, they're basically opinions, but they're studies. A lot of the studies that they cite, I mean, if you read the whole study, it's actually just like it, it's wokeism essentially. And so this is one of those areas where I'm like, yeah, I agree that it's well within their rights to get rid of racist books. Who cares? They can do that. But then there's this weird shadow aspect of it that I find chilling and that we keep seeing happening where it is like a diversity and inclusion and Uh this whole kind of religion that is making decisions. And you see this even with books where they have these like diversity readers. They'll read you know, young adult fiction books before they even get published to make sure that there's nothing offensive in them or nothing culturally insensitive. And then the books will get canceled before they even get published. In some instances, this has happened. So 
this is where I'm a little bit, again, there's no room for nuance on Twitter, but I'm a little bit like, <laughs> eh, okay, I'm fine with the decision, but can we talk about these these forces that seem to be occurring with these decisions? Yeah, and see, and the hard part is we don't, we may not always know the motives why they do this. I mean, it could just be legitimately that, I mean, that, that company was formed by Dr. Seuss's family. And they made it just legitimately said, you know, I don't want us to be associated with these writings anymore. Dr. Seuss himself said he regretted doing it. So, right. but they hired a panel and they deliberated over it for months. So this wasn't like, yeah. you know, people were like, oh, this is strictly a business decision. I'm like, look at every article that has been written about it. That's not an honest answer either, because every article talks about how they got rid of it because they were racist images determined by a panel that deliberated over every single book in the thing for months. So you can't tell me that was a business decision because maybe those books were selling. I, we don't know how they were selling. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I don't, and I don't think it's purely a business decision, but it's more like, like say if, if, if it were me, I could understand why somebody would say, you know what? I don't want to be associated with these books, whether it's business or yeah. not. And, and it yeah. could, and it could, and it could just be, and it could totally be that they were just 100% caving to the left and that they really would have rather had the book there. That could be possible. But I mean, if they took that long to think about it, whatever, we, we don't know the, um, but the see, motivation the, behind it. I agree. But see, here's the problem is that then you have that happening and then it's announced on his birthday, a uh, world right. reader day. And you also now have, Biden won't even mention Dr. Seuss. And this is where I actually think guys like James Lindsay are right on the money. And he's, I think, a couple of years ahead of everyone, even mm -hmm. though he might be going insane. <laughs> 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 I mean, it might be like he's too, too far ahead of the curve. You know, it's, it's got to be like someone who can see in a world of people who are like blind. But he was talking about how you you problematize this person and it's this thing that as a culture we could all unite around. And now you take him out of the, you take Dr. Seuss completely isn't mentioned by Biden. Now he's taken out of the books children read and it's replaced mm -hmm. with, you know, my super racist baby or whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, and so it's replaced with books that are, are appropriate to their kind of ideology. The scripture. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is where I'm like, yeah, I agree. And we can justify it. And sometimes I think like they disappeared our president off social media. I yeah. was thinking about this today. He, he got like disappeared. They did. They did. And and it was like a mob hit. Yeah. A virtual mob hit. <laughs> it was a godfather, like that the last scene. <laughs> Like the virtual mob came for Trump and we were all like, anyways. Yeah. Well, and so, and so what I'll say is this, I mean, there are reasonable reasons to disagree with their decision. That's, that really isn't my problem. I mean, cause the thing is if they continued having the book, I don't care, but I also don't care that they discontinued it. My thing is when we, we, we tend to freak out about so many things. Now I'm not saying that the far left does not have an agenda. That's, that is evident. And to me, Biden not mentioning it is not that big of a deal to me because, I mean, I don't care if a government official talks about Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss is still going to remain an American icon. Nobody's talking about wiping out all of his books. Now, if they start, then I will eat crow and I will say that I was wrong. But we're talking about six books when Dr. Seuss wrote 60 books. And he even didn't even like the work that he did. So in this instance, I don't see this as part of this overwhelming push to 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 take things over i think we need to pay be focusing our our, our outrage on what they're actually doing like i i'm i care more about them canceling gina carano than i do about them that about them canceling these books i mean to me it's 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 like this isn't nazi germany and i heard ben shapiro and i like ben shapiro <laughs> but he's like saying like oh this is like mm. book burning in nazi germany i'm like no it's not dude no no it's not and i get the whole yeah it starts little with little stuff but no th that's not what this is now, disagree well, with the decision, but we don't need to pretend like we're about to have the American version of the Third Reich. No, I agree. I think those are kind that, of... That's my know, only issue with it, really. Hyperbole <laughs> sells, definitely. It does, obviously. Yeah. I think the problem is people are instinct... You know, obviously, there are many problems with this kind of discussion on social media, and it's also just hilarious and kind of funny 
And it's easier to talk about things like Dr. Seuss than the fact that what happened at the Capitol and whatever the FBI director was saying yesterday. It's easier to talk about that than Yemen, bombing Syria, no knock raids, things right. people feel par- powerless over doing anything about. The culture wars are a lazy way to engage without actually having to do anything. And I'm guilty of this. You know, I'm Yeah, we all do. At it. least I'm 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 having conversations about it, but I'm I'm I really have been when things start to open up again, because I used to do tons of volunteer, I could actually felt like I was putting my money where my mouth was. Mm-hmm. But with the absence of being able to do those things, now I feel like I'm just part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And I do think, again, with this Dr. Seuss thing, there's a really actually interesting, nuanced conversation to have, like the one that we are having about, yes, this is a business decision, but there, again, lies in the insidious, creeping authoritarianism that I think everybody perceives and senses. And then you have guys like Glenn Beck and Ben who can react to it that strongly and say this is like this when in fact it's not but there is that creeping sense of like and i can understand that in there (laughs) and i can understand them being concerned about that creeping thing that they're trying to do because we see them do it in other areas like i said with gina carano the reason i care more about that is because that actually impacted her life and Mm -hmm. impacts the life of others like her they disappeared our president (laughs) yeah pure (laughs) But, you know, I I think Cara (laughs) Dune is more important than Trump. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, she's interesting. That was an interesting thing to me, too. I care. I care about that. But as somebody in this town, I'm not surprised. Yeah. You know, that that's just not Bill Burr came out in defense of her. And I'm like, yeah, buddy. (laughs) They've been trying to cancel him for a long time, though. I don't know if they'll be able to. Yeah, you'll I you'll be surprised, though. You know, I don't I thought that about Gina Carano, too, though. So I was wrong. (laughs) I think the most chilling thing about her interview is at the very end of it when she talked about how they had the people from Disney coming by and sitting with her and, and, you know, coaching her on how to apologize and what to say. Yeah. That's like the chilling, chilling stuff. But again, it's like I read about these little panels and I'm like, what kind of panel? Who is on this panel exactly? Well, I want to know, know. Who, who's on those panels. That, that's the scary part. <laughs> that's why, that's <laughs> right, why we're afraid of it, because we know who's on those panels. <laughs> but that's why every time I, I always joke about this, every time I hear diversity, equity, inclusion, mm-hmm. like it's going to be on a freaking microphone out in the court. A drone is going to be flying around saying that you know like in (laughs) like in china where it's just i don't know i i think there's there's a lot of this is what makes it so challenging is that on its face you can defend a lot of these things you can say yeah i understand it's a private company why they have every right to get rid of trump They have every right to fire her. They have every right to get rid of these books. That used to be my opinion. Yeah. I also say I even have a hard time articulating it because it's something I react to like on a visceral level because my logic is like private. I read the article. I was like private company, whatever. They could do what they want. Racist books, you know, and then if you come out and say, okay, that's totally their decision. But can we talk about the bigger underpinning here like the minute i get to like a panel of di- of people <laughs> you're like ooh, that's the panel that's going to be evaluating my twitter feed <laughs> before yeah, i go into what? the you're right. <laughs> yeah and, and see and the thing i'm glad you made that connection because you're right that very same panel is the one that's going to determine what you can say on twitter and on facebook and, and like i said i was more in the whole oh well it's a private company i'm i'm <sighs> My mind is changing on that because <laughs> they have too much power. I mean, I like, especially with, with a company like Google or like Facebook, Twitter. I mean, the, the the power they wield in shaping public opinion. I mean, they have such a monopoly over it that I can't even say it's a free market because it's not free. It's being dominated mm-hmm. by these interests. And they don't necessarily, they're not here to provide a platform for people to share ideas. They're here to promote a certain, uh, a certain, a certain point of view. I mean, and it, it, the fact that I can get suspended on Twitter for something that a left, a black person on the left could easily say and not get suspended, 
that is that is chilling to me. Yeah. And I haven't even gotten it the worst. There's people who, who got it worse than me. So yeah, I mean, in that aspect, yeah, there is an agenda here. And the thing is, they're not even hiding it that well. Yeah. I mean, if you read if you read that they Time magazine, yeah, if you've read that Time magazine piece, they're bragging about it now. They used to try to hide it, but Time yeah. magazine came out with that piece about that whole conspiracy to unseat Trump. And I'm like, this is chilling. Now I already knew this. They just confirmed what I what we already thought. They filled in some details, gave some perspective. But now they're not they're not even hiding it anymore. So what so if they're willing to admit that they're doing this, what are they doing that they're not telling us about? Yeah. And I mean, who is the they in this instance? Mm -hmm. You know, that's always the question. Who is they that's doing this? I, I don't I don't really know. Again, it feels it feels so nebulous and like something that's such it's so frustrating to me because in attempting, for example, like the Dr. Seuss thing, again, is a perfect example of the problem with everything you want to push back and say, yeah, get rid of those racist books. And I'd be all on board. Private company, get rid of those racist mm -hmm. books, whatever. If there, if this wasn't taking place, if it, it's not occurring in a vacuum, right. it's occurring right. in a, it's occurring in a culture where all kinds of things like this are happening on a daily basis and and they're all being explained away in the same language that conservatives would use, actually. Like mm -hmm. the I'll see liberals be like, Oh, it's a private company, blah, blah, blah. And Yeah, they're, they're um, free market when it comes to their agenda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like well, AOC. AOC, I mean, when she raised that money for Texas, she wasn't using progressive principles. She used a conservative principle. She didn't get mm -hmm. the government involved. She was a government official, but she didn't do this in her capacity as a lawmaker. She did it in her capacity as a private citizen, raised that money and used our principles against us. And was she doing it to, 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 to sell her agenda? Hell yeah, she was. Yeah. But she was very smart with it. She's very clever. It's not the first yep. time that she's used a conservative principle to advance a socialist agenda. Oh, that's <laughs> terrifying. So I was I'm interviewing um, this woman next week. And this is something that made me think, too, about just the weird overlappings that are happening in the weird in this new world, the weird alignments. Mm -hmm. And it was written by a adult performer. And she was talking about just the conservatives being basically having like their account shut down and the financial systems kind of coming after these conservative ideas. And you're seeing people put MasterCard put pressure on Patreon with like Sargon and right. uh, how they're applying that pressure. And she was saying they've been doing this to porn stars for 30 years and really? they've had to find their way around it. And she was telling all these stories and interviewing all these adult performers about like Chase closing bank accounts and weird things that I had no idea. Like the fact that, Really, it's MasterCard and Visa who are making kind of setting the the rules for things might be federally legal in terms of whatever it might be pornography, but a MasterCard and Visa set the rules for what you can actually see. Like, for instance, fisting is allowed federally, but in order to get paid for it, like on by as an adult performer, if you're mm -hmm. selling it a thumb has to be outside. <laughs> you have got to be shitting me. Uh, no, and be... this is a, this is a policy that MasterCard and Visa have. So they have all these weird policies. <laughs> like it's crazy. Could you imagine it's... being in the room when they were trying to figure this out? <laughs> no, this is like how South Park always messes with the censors where they do things that they just know they're going to force like the censor and the people who have to evaluate it to like count how many times they're doing things or push that right. just so they can have them have to have these discussions. Like it, it's, it's wild to me. And I was thinking like what, I mean, it's the word I made up ultimately, like what a fetishy that mm -hmm. conservatives and the adult you know, performers are more and more going to be aligned in this fight right. against the financial institutions. Like right. who would have seen that coming 20 or 30 <laughs> years ago? I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, could, wow. I mean, could, could you even imagine like Rush Limbaugh having to talk about that back in the day? No. Or, yeah. Yeah. No one, no one saw this coming. Yeah. Except for maybe, the adult performers. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, 
I'm glad. <laughs> well, this has been so fun. I could talk to you for like hours. This, this is going into Rogan lengths. Um, that means we need to do us, it again. We'll have to, we'll do it again for sure. So tell everyone where we can find you, your writing, you on social media, your locals, your YouTube channel, all of it. Yeah. So YouTube, you can find me breaking conservatarian. Um, I'm also a co-host of the red and black show on YouTube. You can get me on social media at Jeff on the right on Twitter. Um, actually that's my handle on every social media platform. Uh, you can catch my writing on redstate.com, libertynation.com. Oh, and my locals community is a uh, people with minds.com. Well, I think it's locals.com slash people with minds. And uh, yeah, de- 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 definitely show up. I'm going to be putting a lot of uh, members only content up there. I'm really trying to get that into gear. So show up and we can have some awesome conversations, premium content, live chats, all that good stuff. Cool. I love it. No, thank only you fans, so much. Though. <laughs> not yet <laughs> it's not gonna yet. be conservatives with their guns on only fans <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> the only place it's allowed right <sighs> oh this was fun so thank you for just everything you do i really appreciate your voice out there i will do my part to amplify it wherever i can and just keeping your badass self thank you thank you It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. I'm going to file my column and it's just going to be handwritten and tell them they have to post a (laughs) picture of it. (laughs) Bridget is computerless. Which is like when I injured my hand and realized how often I used my hand. I can't tell you how many times throughout the day I'm like, I'm going to do, oh, I can't. I don't have a computer. I'm going to do, oh, I can't. I don't have a computer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, I mean, if this is Apple's ploy to get me to buy another computer, it's absolutely working. At least you live with someone who has a computer you use. I'm thinking like, what would I do if I didn't have one? Like I would be just, I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. We're so dependent on them. It's pathetic. I mean, thank God I have my phone so I can still do some of the things I need to do. Yeah, no, my phone is like tiny and old. I could never, <laughs> I could never just like work for my How phone. How do you even I guess deal I could set up thing. my iPad so I could work. If Maggie I has to. an Apple like four. No, I have a six <laughs> like a four SE S. or something like that. When, I upgraded from the four to the six. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to get my other computer serviced, they told me that it was vintage. And it's only eight years old. Eight years old. Yeah. No, Isn't that crazy that nuts. vintage and technology is eight years old? That's crazy. Yeah. They're like, yeah, we won't touch that. <laughs> <laughs> it might contaminate the rest yeah. of our things. <laughs> Sorry, Apple, but your stuff's already contaminated. Yeah. my com- The stupid new keypads that I hated from day one because I hated the new keypads and I didn't like the sound. No, you hated the sound, like despised it. The misophonia is real. Uh huh. And it triggered it badly. And so I was like, how am I ever going to get over this misophonia typing? And I kind of had, but just loathed the new butterfly or whatever they are. And it turns out they suck. And they're not using them anymore because every little piece of speck of dust that gets under it causes the keys to get stuck. Yeah. And then I couldn't, I was flying to South Africa and I was late to file my column. I know this is shocking (laughs) for people to hear who know me. And I'm like, okay, open up my computer and I'm all ready to file and the space bar is stuck. I was like, (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) How am I supposed to use this? (laughs) So then I was hitting my computer because there's one technique that you can use that I read about on YouTube where you hit the back of your computer to try and get it unstuck. Uh Uh-huh. And you need compressed air, which obviously I don't have on an airplane. Uh (laughs) And yeah, it was just a nightmare. Not not like a real nightmare, just more of a first world nightmare. Yeah. (laughs) But now they don't even make those no they changed them because as i knew from day one from the sound they sucked (laughs) they were a disaster (laughs) waiting to happen (laughs) apple should use me as a consumer tester (laughs) how does this sound bridget it sounds like it's gonna suck (laughs) and i was right (laughs) yep i'm gonna be filing all my columns with a typewriter (laughs) 
How did anybody? <laughs> how did anybody get anything done before computers and the internet? Remember the clack of the typewriter? Yeah, I, knew. I have a Those typewriter are somewhere. So loud. <laughs> so loud. I'm gonna get one just to drive my husband mad. I don't know. No, things. The world moved at a lot slower pace because it took longer to get shit done. <laughs> like forever right like writing a paper out freehand rather than typing it imagine just having to you know even the stuff that we do like filing and signing and all the stuff we sign online Mm -hmm. now which is probably not great but you had to Get those documents printed and then f- send Mail them, them out. out. <laughs> I just this, and then that was before like fax machines, which were revolutionary, <laughs> and now fax machines are antiquated. I just went through this recently where I had to write a check for something, mm-hmm. and I <laughs> can't remember the last time I wrote a check. <laughs> And I felt like I didn't know how to write a check anymore. And the lady, I was like, "Do you need to sign this?" She's like, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> That's kind of the point. I write checks to myself um, mm. and put like deposit them to my different bank accounts that way be, rather than transferring money because I don't want the fee, the transfer fee between like banks. Oh, you get transfer fees? Yeah, it's fucking annoying. That's crazy. Bank of America, like if you transfer oh, from God. one bank to Why another. Why do you still have Bank of America? I've been telling you to drop them for 10 years now, Maggie. It's where I pay my bills from. I don't really use them for anything else, but I can. I hate that. They bank. have just branches everywhere. So I can always just go nope. to an ATM. Nope. I'll never forget the glee with which I shut down my account mm-hmm. after they charged me because of their stupid policy I know. where they took my money out before my money went in and then they charged me an overdraft fee, even though I had money going in. And they're like, oh, we just, this is the way we process things. Uh huh. And I was like, this is stealing. I don't even know how this is legal. And then I took all my money. It was about (laughs) $2.45. And I was like, never again, Bank of America. (laughs) Same with Chase. When Chase shut down my account because apparently I'm a terrorist. Oh, God. For moving three times. In like how many years? Three, one year. (laughs) You don't even know what you signed away, America, with the Patriot Act. And you won't find out until suddenly your bank account is shut for no reason and no explanation, and they don't owe you one. That's crazy. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, they can freeze your whole life and just call you a terrorist. That's why the domestic terrorist stuff that they're trying to do. terrifying. Yeah. I don't know what these people are thinking. I know. And it's, it's, it's all fine for people when they're like, oh, that was the other side. It's like, it works both ways. The irony of that is all the people who were like, yeah, keep these Muslims out of here. <laughs> They're now on the domestic terrorist, terrorist watch, watch <laughs> no-fly list. Uh, it's all fun and games until the no-fly list comes for you, my <laughs> friends. Yeah. It's all so crazy. Next week's episode is so interesting with a adult film star yeah and we talk a lot about this the financial institutions and how the fetacy of the financial institutions censoring the porn stars for 30 years and now they're going to be in alignment with the concern they're going to be on the same team as the conservatives uh uh-huh. i was like i'm looking forward to that one. Oh, it's so good we had such a great conversation I love this podcast so much. I know. It's so fun. It's so random. The variety of guests. Yeah. That's the whole point of it. It's so much in my heart and joy that we can go from Ayan Hirsi Ali to an adult film star in two episodes. Uh Uh-huh. That's why it's so aptly named Walk-In's Welcome. It's yep. just basically anyone who walks, wanders through the door. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Pretty much. Do you have a story? I have a microphone. (laughs) I was thinking of just driving around America and taking stock of the post-pandemic ruins. Yeah. Maybe I should just put everything in storage. (laughs) Once again. Once again. (laughs) Buy myself a little camper van. Like you've always wanted. And then take off. You know, these YouTube videos... The van life videos, Maggie. Oh, yeah. That is big business right there. <laughs> you can just follow behind us in your, in your car. <laughs> Why don't I get a van life? 
<laughs> my own camper van. I just stay in my Subaru. You guys are in some like sweet camper. We're like a swanky <laughs> van, but some where we buy some van. I'm that, like, guys, can I use your bathroom, please? <laughs> <laughs> we buy some old tour bus that some band that had to get disbanded because of the pandemic is selling for Super dirt cheap. cheap. There's like eight beds. We're like, sorry, Maggie. <laughs> You'll have to sleep this in your car. This is our car. honeymoon. <laughs> we need privacy. <laughs> Everything is going to be our honeymoon from now on. Ten years from now. We'll be like, no guests, please. This is our honeymoon. <laughs> Let's uh, crowdsource funding Maggie's camper van. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go fund me Maggie's camper van. We really should just hit the road. Go I'm on, on a summer board. tour. I'm on board. Till we find a place to live. <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> was what the, we wanted to do. Was cruise know. around America and find a place to live. I mean, maybe that idea will come to life again. Uh-huh. The dream that never died. <laughs> we drive around for six months. We when... dream long and hard in fantasy. We have dreams that just won't die, such as fantasy itself. <laughs> we'll never die. Fantasy is not fantasy. <sighs> and you'll just see me walking up and down the beach in Miami. Trying to sell those same damn t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Original printing. Circa 2005. Dear Lord. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Skillshare, Beta Brand, and The Jordan Harbinger Show. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash walkin and get a free trial of premium membership. Discover what it's like to be comfortable and confident all the time. Go to betabrand.com slash walkin for 30% off. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesee. I'm Bridget Fettesee, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)